Embattled and defiant, Benjamin Netanyahu on the offensive after the UN vote against Israeli settlements. He's facing pressure at home and isolation overseas. So what now for the Israeli Prime Minister and his fragile government? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Now, for years, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been forced to walk a thin line, you could say. Hardline conservatives within the country, even within the governing coalition, want Netanyahu to dismiss the idea of a Palestinian state altogether. But much of the international community continues to push for a two-state solution. After last week's United Nations vote, the pressure is ramping up on both ends. Netanyahu's political tightrope is now even thinner. The Security Council resolution calls for Israel to immediately stop building new settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. More significantly, the United States refused to use its veto. Netanyahu condemned the resolution and is already taking action against some countries who supported it. He's also blamed U.S. President Barack Obama specifically for allowing the vote to pass. Over decades, the American administrations and Israeli governments have disagreed about settlements. But we agreed that the Security Council was not the place to resolve this issue. We knew that going there would make negotiations harder and drive peace further away. I'm encouraged uh, by the statements of our friends in the United States, Republicans and Democrats alike. They understand how reckless and destructive this UN resolution was. They understand that the Western Wall isn't occupied territory. I look forward to uh, working with those friends and with the new administration when it takes office next month. Well, Israeli settlements have expanded into Palestinian territory at a rapidly increasing rate over the past few decades. Israel has built 147 settlements in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. There are about 400,000 settlers living on Palestinian territory in the occupied West Bank, with another 200,000 in East Jerusalem. Some of them are living in settler outposts. Nearly a hundred have been set up in the West Bank without the approval of the Israeli government. Now, Netanyahu has repeatedly said he's against them, the same stance taken by his predecessor, Ariel Sharon. But members of the Knesset have been pushing to legalize the outposts. They approved a preliminary version of the law earlier this month and have been putting pressure on Netanyahu to back the plan. Let's bring our guests into the show. We have in Tel Aviv, Yossi Balin. He's the former Israeli Minister of Justice who, for 20 years, served in the Knesset for the Labour Party. In West Jerusalem, we have Oded Ravivi. He's the Ch Chief Foreign Envoy for the Yesha Council, an organization which oversees Israeli settlements. And in London, we have Yossi Meckelberg, a Professor of International Relations at Regents University. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Yossi Balin. Is the UN resolution enforcing divisions within Israeli politics as we focus in this show on what this resolution means for Israeli politics? I think that the UN resolution uh, is uh, actually exposing uh, the differences uh, in our policy, but mainly refute the main claim of Mr. Netanyahu that actually the world forgot about the Palestinians, the Arabs forgot about the Palestinian issues. There are more serious issues in our region, mainly Syria, and as a result of it, he can have uh, very good relations with the whole world uh, without uh, solving the Palestinian uh, problem. Will that, this Yossi uh, Bailin, in reinvigorate the left wing uh, in Israeli refuted. politics? Well, it's too, too early to judge. I would not jump to this uh, conclusion. I hope so, of course. Uh, but uh, I believe that it will be used as it is used in order to expose Netanyahu and his false uh, policy. Okay, let's bring Oded into the show. Um, clearly, Netanyahu has some choices to make. Do you think he's going to move even further to the right towards what some of his coalition partners like the Jewish Home are calling for? I think basically there is definitely a, a, ch a very good chance that that's what's going to happen because you have to remember what happened in the United Nations is an act uh, initiated by the Palestinians which was not done with understanding and when things are done without understanding just by one side deciding that they want to pull to one side 
Don't be surprised if the other side pulls to the other side. And I think that's basically what's standing behind the Minister of Defense announcement today to the Palestinians. You know what? You want to play the game by yourself. I'm not answering any more of your uh, requests for cooperation. I also know how to disconnect and disengage. And I think that for anybody who lives in this region is a clear uh, worry because if there is any chance for peace, it's only by direct dialogue through negotiations around the same Let's table. Let's focus, if we could, no there, rather than on the dynamic between the Israelis Nations, and the Palestinians and, and the peace process. Let's just remind ourselves, we want to focus this show, because we've, we've covered that in an earlier show just a few days ago. We want to focus really on what this means for domestic Israeli politics and Israel's relations with the outside world. So having said that, perhaps a good point to bring in Yossi Meckelberg. Uh, the, the, the point there made by Oded that, you know, perhaps when there will be a more of a push towards one side, as he put it. If, it's, if that one side is more towards the right, what does that mean for Israel's relations with the outside world? More international in isolation? Well, I think it's obvious from the vote in the United Nations when you have 14 countries support the resolution, even the one that abstained the United States was in the clear support of the resolution, that the Netanyahu's government policy isolate uh, Israel in the world. I think also you can see from what I can see only almost an hysterical reaction by the Netanyahu government uh, by cancelling visits of, of dignitaries, uh, basically telling uh, Israeli officials not to visit other countries. Actually, what Netanyahu government is doing is pushing Israel into a corner, pushing Israel into, into isolation. And you know, they can, you can draw a conclusion from the uh, resolution either that Israel needs to reflect on its policies because the entire international community sends a clear message that the settlements are illegal and if Israel is sincere about a peace agreement based on two and two state solution it needs to stop the settlements activity immediately. Yo Yossi Michael, but let, let me jump in though with the point that Oded I'm sure would raise and, uh, as he put it there he sees Netanyahu's government's reaction, not as hysterical, but as something natural, uh, a natural, he would say, reaction to what he sees as uh, a, an unbalanced resolution in the UN. What do you make of that, Yossi Makhlouf? Well, well, I think when one reads the resolution very carefully, probably one will reach a conclusion that is way more balanced than what the, the representatives of the settlers or the Netanyahu government says. It talks about two-state solution. It calls for the end of terrorism. Make sure, make preventing uh, acts of violence. It actually even leaves the room for both sides to negotiate changes in the borders of the 4th of June 1967. It just says clearly it's up to the sides to negotiate directly any change of what it calls the status quo. Right. Everyone understands that any peace agreement will need swap of land and the border of 4th of June 67 is a more of a benchmark that where the border is going to end in a peace agreement. But I think if you look at all the points of this resolution, it's a way more balanced okay. uh, resolution. Let me bring in Yossi Balin back into the discussion. If where we're going with our thinking is that the Netanyahu government may be about to move further right. How far right? Let's talk in terms of policies. I mean, is it going to end at simple diplomatic measures and recalling ambassadors? Will it go as far as some of his coalition partners are calling for, for annexing more of the West Bank, declaring sovereignty over the, West, the occupied West Bank, abandoning the two-state solution officially? I don't think so. I mean, the idea of a two-state solution is a national interest of Israel, and Prime Minister Netanyahu is repeating this uh, idea. He says, I don't want to have a one-state solution, I don't want to have a binational uh, so solution, and uh, even if he reneged on it before the elections, he can, then uh, came back to it, and he understands that there is a real problem for Israel if it is in a situation where, while, while a minority of uh, Jews are uh, dominating a majority of, uh, of Palestinians. He doesn't want to get to this uh, point, and I uh, trust that this is true. So, on the one hand, I must say that I cannot understand his reactions. It, is, it seems hysterical when he is actually uh, doesn't want to, to meet anybody, cancels meetings of the Prime Minister of China and or, of, of whatever. But on the other hand, I think that although he was surprised, no doubt, 
by the, the resolution of Friday, he also understands that he has to do something. And maybe, maybe it will go the other way around. Of course, this is my hope, that he will understand that in order to change the international attitude towards Israel, he has to initiate something. And I believe that this initiative is something which is very, very simple and something which has been agreed upon already both by Israel and the Palestinians years ago. And this is the implementation of the roadmap of but 2003. That, let me jump in again, Mainly Yossi Balin, sorry, to, to get keep, to keep the, the focus. second step. Well, but is that likely, though? I mean, practically speaking, one of the first decisions he's going to have to make is, is what is he going to do about the Beit Yehudi, a Jewish homeland uh, bill, which uh, the leader of the party said only on Sunday, de December the 25th, they were going to introduce a, a bill to bring Ma'ali Adomim first to the Knesset um, to extend what he calls Israeli sovereignty over there. At that point, Netanyahu has to make a real decision about does he try to keep his coalition together and go along with that or face whatever the alternative is. Here it is very much up to uh, President-elect uh, Trump. He will not, Netanyahu will not do something like that uh, without consulting uh, the new American administration. If uh, Mr. Trump is telling him, it's fine with me, you may annex whatever you want, it's wonderful, I don't believe that Netanyahu uh, will restrain himself uh, referring to Malay Adomim, not to the whole uh, West Bank, but uh, to, to Malay Adomim which will be a big mistake, but if uh, Trump allows him to do that, he might do that. If Trump right. uh, says to him, L let me think about it or, or whatever, don't uh, do something like this uh, so quickly, uh, I, I believe uh, that Netanyahu uh, will take this, uh, uh, this advice and will not do anything okay. and will confront uh, the Jewish home. I mean, he is confronting all the time the other parties of his uh, coalition. From the uh, left, okay. is, there is only one, and from the right, there are many, and he will continue to do that. All right, Yosef Bader, let me give Odin a chance to come in here. You raised a good point there about Trump, but I want us to hold off on that for a second. I'll, I'll get to that with Yossi Meckelberg. But I want to come back to Odin and ask the question of, do you agree with that analysis that despite the pressure from some of the coalition partners, uh, to move ahead with settlements, to extend sovereignty, to officially announce the end of the two-state solution. Do you agree with Yossi Balin? He says that's unlikely that Netanyahu will actually do that. I don't know yet to analyze what Netanyahu will do or won't do. But I think there's something fundamentally wrong with what's happening at the moment in the program and also by the international pressure. Even if we accept everything that Yossi Balin said, there are two things which raise an eyebrow. One is, never was there reached an agreement that the uh, green line will be the new border or there will be some agreement about land swap and we will sign a peace agreement. We know that we had two prime ministers, Ehud Barak and Ehud Olmert, offering between 92 to 96 percent of the land. No peace was agreed. We know that 84 percent of the Jewish population in Judea and Samaria are actually west of the security fence that was actually built, and there's no peace. And so if I could jump in, oh, that, uh, we Netanyahu could get into a deep discussion. I, I'm not sure if you're, if you're suggesting that land for peace was never discussed in previous no, negotiations, but, but, but I, I, I'm not I, sure I, that's I, really I, accurate. I, I, but if, so if we could get back to the point of analyzing I'll, I'll, what this means for the current Israeli government, I'd really appreciate it. Because, because I'll tell you exactly what it means. It means that as much as the international pressure thinks that they're effective, at the end of the day, let's say that pressure actually works. There's nobody on the other side who is willing to agree to what the international community wants. So whether it's going to play tactics and politics with the international community to get them back on board, definitely there's a heavy role of the new president-elect to see which side he's going to take. But besides that, Netanyahu doesn't, can't comply to the international pressure because there's nobody on the other side who will also comply to the international pressure. You have more and more Palestinians saying that they want to be part of Israel and they don't want to have independence because they see what's happening in Arab countries around. So when that's the situation, that's where the Israelis raise an eyebrow and say to themselves, doesn't the international community see that? <clears throat> don't they realize that there's no partner on the other side who is willing for a compromise? And that's where we are puzzled and that's why you see part of the coalition saying, you know what, so let's go down the road. 
which we believe we should go to. Let's annex it. Let's see how we manage to run this whole area. And to be frank and honest with you, before, until 1967, the Palestinians had one situation. And ever since then, they've enjoyed a lot of improvement that people are not willing to admit. All right. I'm not sure all Palestinians would agree that they've enjoyed benefits or improvements under occupation, but we'll leave that perhaps to another chat. You're more than welcome Let's, to come and see if them. If I could bring in Yossi Mackelberg into the show. The discussion is going inevitably in the direction of Trump. How much of what Netanyahu decides to do next will depend on the position of Donald Trump when he comes into the Oval Office? There is no doubt that Israel needs to take into account what any American administration says. And as much as uh, right now Netanyahu berates uh, Obama, uh, even Obama signed a military aid to the tune of $38 billion just a few months ago, and basically didn't put too much pressure on Israel when it comes to the peace agreement. Uh, for instance, said uh, Obama would have uh, sanctioned voting uh, in favor of condemning the settlements 2011, we might have been in a completely different place now. But this we have to leave uh, to historians. As far as Trump is unpredictable, his a, a, attitude is very erratic. And from his appointment, it's, uh, we get some signs, but it's difficult. If you look at the new American ambassador uh, to Israel, if it's ever approved, confirmed by, the, by Congress, it means that he will support expansion of settlements and maybe even an annexation. But uh, I think it will be a, a very, very quick learning curve for, for Trump when he actually entered on the 20th of January into the White House and learned that what he could say or tweet all the time, he can't necessarily make happen when he is in power. And he will realize that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the world in general is way more, more complex than 140 characters, and he might change his opinions. Yossi Balin, whatever Trump does decide to do or not to do, in a sense, might the result of this sort of cycle or the, this trend that Israel is in right now isn't it going to end with Israel more reliant than ever on the Trump administration in the U.S.? You're 100% right. I mean, if this is the case, and if now when Netanyahu sees that the world did not uh, forget uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and did not uh, give up on its uh, opposition to settlements, if uh, today still Netanyahu will lean so much on the new American administration, it will make Israel much more dependent than, uh, than today. And uh, this will be a big uh, problem. And again, of course, I mean, the, the issue that it is uh, up to, uh, to Trump uh, to decide for us is very problematic because we are having our own interests, which are not necessarily the American interests, and mainly the idea of having Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, both of them. And, and I'm not sure that this is exactly the, the interest of, of the Americans. I mean, even if, if tomorrow uh, Trump is saying, annex whatever you can, should we do that? Even if Oded is right and there are many Palestinians who are happy to become Israeli citizens rather than to have their own independence, is this, is this the right policy for us to accept it? to become again a minority in our own country, rather than to, 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 uh, to, to partition the country and to have two states? This is the big question. So it, is, it should be up to us and not up neither to the uh, Palestinians who might be, uh, be ready to be our citizens, nor to the new American uh, administration with all due respect. All right, let me bring Oded into the discussion and ask you this then. Do you think that's a good place for Israel to be in, so reliant not only on one country, the United States, but particularly on one administration? Is that a good long-term plan for Israel? I think at the end of the day, uh, the question is undermining Prime Minister Netanyahu, who has proven in the last few decades that he might be the most talented politician around in the world. He survived endless uh, other leaders, endless un, uh, other politicians who wanted to uh, undercut him. And he is still on his chair. He managed to survive eight years with a quite hostile administration. And like just the other person said, he got quite a good uh, deal 
a few months ago regarding the foreign aid to the state of Israel. So I think he's not just relying on the current new uh, elected administration. He's building up other bridges, which even in America, they're raising an eyebrow how quickly and how efficient Israel is building these relationships. It's true they didn't come into fruition in the last agreement in the United Nations resolution. But at the end of the day, we're looking at the broader picture, not just on one resolution. This resolution is one of many that have been a, a agreed upon or voted upon in the past. And they're not the ones who are going to promote peace. Peace will come only through direct negotiations. And yes, Israel has a lot of allies, which might not have been that efficient last Friday night. But the day before, we were all very impressed with how Egypt reacted. So let's not take one event and one course and say whole Israel's relationship is relying just on one new president-elect. Okay, let's take that point uh, to Yossi Meckelberg in London. Um, are we overlooking, as Oded would have it there, perhaps Israel's relations with other countries that haven't been maybe so active in the UN Security Council? What do you make of that? I think the settlers are deluding themselves. Uh, reality, what we saw in the Security Council is the manifestation of what the entire international community wants to see. Want to see serious peace negotiation. I'm sorry to say, but yes, maybe the, the Palestinian side is not the perfect uh, partner, but there is a partner, and it's more the Israeli government that blocks serious, serious nego negotiations based on dealing with all the outstanding uh, issues between the, the Israelis and, and, and the Palestinians. When you have a vote which 15 countries basically support the same thing, including the countries that only a few months ago Netanyahu gave a speech in, in, the secure, in the General Assembly talking about it doesn't matter anymore because everyone is a friend of Israel, everyone supports Israel, everyone is actually doing business with Israel, but what happened Friday actually defies this. The idea that they are not against Israel, they are actually caring about the prosperity of Israel, they care about the security of Israel, but they don't want to well, allow well, let, let me jump in here, yes, the Michael, what, what, what do you make of the argument that comes sometimes that actually the map of Europe is changing too? While there, there is a, a movement amongst the left wing in Europe to try and target goods made in settlements, uh, the right is yeah. rising in Europe and somehow the right in Europe seems to find common ground uh, with Israel. I think you're right. I think this is something, you know, there is quite a sad story that develops in Europe itself to see the rise of the right, not just the, you know, what we are used to see, the, the conservative party, the Christian Democrat parties, but the far right. We, we have to wait and see what will happen in Germany, in France in the election. We saw with Brexit here. And you know, it's a very strange turn of events in history that Israel's future, maybe current, allies are among, come from among the far right. Those are the, not the natural allies that Israel would like to see. I know in this case, you know, there is the kind of uh, distortion of realities here in Europe. They see Muslims as, as, as an enemy. Some push this point and they win elections. Migration is a big issue. But the conclusion, the, the deduction from this, that as a result of it, these are Israel allies, I think Israel will have to regret it. All right. Some interesting thoughts have come up in this show. I'm sure we can go on uh, more. But let's, for now, thank our guests and take a break on this uh, topic. We've had an interesting uh, contribution there by Yossi Balin, Oded Ravivi, and Yossi Meckelberg. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. Well, from me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here in Inside Story. For now, thanks for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>